Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Future of Medicine presented by Technion Canada in conjunction with Our Crowd. Our Crowd is a global venture investment platform that empowers institutions and individuals to invest and engage in emerging companies. We are thrilled to have you here today for this special program. My name is Steve Bramson. I have served on the Technion Canada Board of Directors since 2014, and I'm a proud alternate member of Technion Israel's Board of Governors. I am pleased to be co-hosting today's event with my fellow Technion Canada Board member, Doron Deckel. And we are truly privileged to be hearing from today's speaker, Technion Professor Moshe Shoham, a world-renowned expert and entrepreneur in the field of medical robotics. Professor Shoham will be introducing us to a specially designed robotic system that enables surgeons to conduct safer and more accurate surgical procedures. He will also be sharing highlights of his research at the Technion and his partnership with our crowd. As a technophile, I cannot wait to learn more about what Professor Shoham's incredible innovations and experiences were. But first, I would like to call upon Alyssa Greisman to say a few words about Technion Canada. Thank you, Steve. As Steve mentioned, I'm Alyssa Greisman and I'm the National Executive Director of Technion Canada. Welcome everyone. Technion Canada is a national organization dedicated to raising support and awareness, and awareness for the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, Israel's first university and a thinking hub of scientific research, education and innovation. Since its founding in 1912, the Technion has educated generations of engineers, architects and scientists who have played key roles in the high-tech industries, both in Israel and around the world. Technion have brought the unique skills and penchant for innovation, which helped conceive and consolidate the modern state of Israel, commonly acknowledged to be the startup nation. Over 70% of startups coming from Israel are either founded by or led by Technion graduates, something we are very proud of. We are honored to be partnering on today's event with our crowd, the most active venture investor in Israel, who have backed several Technion and affiliated startups, including Professor Shoham's current venture, Tamar Robotics. We look forward to welcome, welcoming all of you to the Technion community and look forward to seeing you at upcoming programs. Enjoy this little taste of Technion and the science of doing good video. And then I invite David Shore to tell us a little bit more about our crowd. Before we begin, behind the ideas and hurdles, the trial and error, the striving and the greatness, through ups and downs, there is a vision, a vision that never changes, the vision to do good. This is Technion. Where does vision come from? From people like you, enlightened minds who fill the future with care, guardians of all we share. Doing good by protecting this precious planet, harnessing energy resources to empower tomorrow and learning from the scientific genius of nature. Doing good by advancing world health through revolutionary scientific insight medical treatments, and life-saving technology. Doing good by opening all channels of data. Predicting future needs, anticipating the next wave of innovation, and keeping it all safe. Doing good by transferring the power of discovery from laboratory to marketplace and sharing the culture of creativity across the world. Doing good with the vision to create something from nothing. Releasing the power of inspiration so that everything becomes possible. Doing good with Technion, where great minds come together to create a brighter future for all. Technion, from visionary education to a world of impact. Hello, 
Thanks very much, uh, Steve and Elisa. It's uh, great to partner once again with uh, Technion Canada on, uh, on today's event. Uh, I'm David Shore. I'm the Vice President for Investor Relations uh, based here in Toronto in Canada. And uh, we are very, very excited to, uh, to hear from uh, Professor Shoham, uh, essentially the world leader in, uh, in medical robotics and uh, going to be telling us a little bit about uh, his background and uh, Tamar Robotics, which is a company that's currently available for investment uh, on the Aircrowd platform. Uh, I will be speaking a little bit more about Aircrowd after Professor Shoham's presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Doron Dekel from Technion Canada to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Shoham. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Doron Dekel, and I'm a proud uh, technical, uh, uh, Technion alumnus and Technion uh, Canada board member. I graduated from the Technion's uh, Faculty of Computer Engineering in 86 following my father, who is a graduate of the Technion's uh, Faculty of Architecture and followed by my younger brother, who is also a Technion graduate in computer engineering. I came to Canada about 30 years ago and my career has focused on the development of advanced medical visualization and surgical navigation products. I'm currently the co-CEO of Claronav, a medical device development and production company based in Toronto. And I've had the pleasure of working with Professor Shoham on a number of professional endeavors in the past. After Professor Shoham's presentation, we will have the opportunity to learn more about our crowd and to ask questions in a brief Q&A session. And now it's uh, my honor to introduce Professor Moshe Shoham. Professor Shoham is an emeritus professor of mechanical engineering and former head of the robotics laboratory uh, at the Technion. Professor Shoham received his BSc in Aeronautical Engineering and MSc and DSc in Mechanical Engineering from the Technion, where he has been teaching for the past 30 years. And he's currently the uh, Tamara and Harry Handelsman Academic Chair in the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, Professor Shoham is a pioneer of new and developing fields in medical robotics and is a worldwide acclaimed authority in the field. His life's work is dedicated to developing technologies that improve patient care. He is the founder of uh, Mazo Robotics, uh, a spinal robotics developer, which was acquired by Medtronic in 2018 in a $1.7 billion uh, deal. He's also the co-founder of uh, Microbot Medical, Exact Robotic, and Tamar Robotics. Professor Shoham holds 50 patents and more than a dozen awards, including the prestigious uh, 2013 Thomas Edison Patent Award and being elected into the National Academy of Engineering. Professor Shaham. Thank you very much, uh, Doron. Thank you very much, uh, David, for this presentation. Um, so I would like right now, if possible, to share my screen so that we can uh, run it from here. Thank you. I hope that everybody is right now is seeing my screen. So just to make a, a little bit smaller, this is not about uh, the future of medicine. This is about uh, the future of medical robots uh, in medicine. And the, the title here is On the Horizon of Medical Robotics. So I'm from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, Department of Mechanical Engineering. But there are several companies that came from uh, my laboratory. Uh, some I, I co-founded as well. So Mazo Robotic, we just mentioned, it was bought uh, by Medtronic about two years ago. Microbot Medical is uh, another company that right now is uh, traded on NASDAQ. Exact Robotics is another company that uh, gained FDA approval and right now starting selling in the United States. Tamar Robotics, I'm going to talk about it right now. Uh, Diagnostic Robotics is another company that uh, we founded and uh, our crowd also invested in this, into this one. And the last one is Foresight Robotics. So there is uh, the list almost all of the companies right now that actually came, the technology came out from the Technion uh, in Israel. So I would like to show you, this is a map of uh, medical robots right now in commercial use in the operating room. So you can see here about a dozen companies right now that in the market there'll be a little bit less than that. But out of these companies, there are three that actually came from Israel. And there is uh, one more also that it is uh, right now being, uh, being uh, uh, right now used uh, in the United States. It also came from Israel and from actually 
students that uh, work in our laboratory. So what you can see over here is, uh, you see that Israel right, has right now a big share of what it's called, what has happened right now in medical robotics. So how do we see past, present, and near future of uh, surgical robots? So in the past, as you can see over here at first, the surgeon cut and then see what happened. Most of the cases he couldn't help that much. Today, we use several imaging devices like, for example, CT, MRI, ultrasound to first see and then, then make the cuts. Our future vision is first see, again, using any kind of imaging device, then plan what we would like to do, and then we will call a robot to help us conduct the plan better than a surgeon can do with his own, his own free hand. So this is how we see uh, the medical robotics right now going into the operating room. And this was the base of Mazo Robotics Company. So uh, surgical robot in use, I believe that most of you know the Da Vinci uh, robot, which I think uh, right now it is the most popular one. And we designed something a little bit different in terms of size and also how it operates. It's not operate like uh, remote manipulation, which means follows the surgeon hand. It, it works a little bit different. So this is the first uh, Mazo Robotic uh, robot. And uh, we, the first application we looked at is uh, what we call spinal fusion. Many cases, about half a million cases a year, there is in the United States a procedure of, of a spinal fusion. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, this is called the disc herniation. And there is a pressure on the nerve. And uh, one of the procedures, not all of them, is to take several screws, insert it into the vertebra and connect them by road, as you can see on the left-hand side down. However, this is a very delicate case. For example, what you can see here on the right-hand side, it is a screw that went through the spinal canal, and this person is uh, paralyzed. So it is very delicate and very important to go to the right location. When you look at the misplaced screw, about 10% are misplaced. Not all, of, not all of them carries clinical significance, but uh, some of them around 3% do. So we decided that let's us plan where we would like to insert the screws into the vertebra and let's us ask a robot to perform this plan in, with better accuracy that uh, the surgeon can do with his own free hand. And this is what we did in Mazor. You can see here uh, on down on the middle that planning device, planning uh, screen. And then you can see on the right hand side up where uh, the robot directs the surgeon to the right location, to the right trajectory. And you can see here a very short video that tells you how this is actually works. You can see here the robot itself it's connected to the spine. This is why the robot in this case is very small. And then it moves its hand along the plant trajectory very accurately. And then a screw can be inserted into the right position using the robot. See, this, this is how Mazo Robotics is working. And what happened today is that this, uh, you can see it again in uh, real life with a surgeon. There are ma three main advantages of the robot. First, it is more accurate than the surgeon free hand, that we know definitely. Secondly, it can work minimally invasive from the outside. You don't have to really cut big, big uh, cut into the, into the person, but you can work through very small, very delicate uh, stab incisions. And third, it reduces dramatically the radiation during a surgery, which is good for the medical staff and for the patient as well. So what happened that uh, we started this uh, robot, actually Mazor founded in 2001, which is quite a long time ago. It was first in this field, and it is when you first, it's also very difficult, as you might imagine, but right now, you can see the worldwide clinical utilization in many countries. I think the numbers are here are, are uh, not uh, completely updated, but there are the robot performs more than 50,000 cases 
and more than half a million implants, which means are uh, like uh, a pedicle screw and other things, that other implants in the body. Um, it can work open or minimal invasive. Actually, the, the percentage of minimally invasive, it is about threefold and even fourfold than what used to be before using the robot. So this is uh, right now, it is uh, a located, it is uh, uh, based in more than 250 hospitals around the world. And actually it was sold to Metronic. You just heard about this. And uh, Metronic, once it does that, it also established in Israel, a global innovation center on robotics. So most of the, of Metronic, innovations in robotics right now are based in Israel. It's called the MAGIC, which stands for Mazor Metronic Global Innovation Center. And we designed the next generation of robots over there. So this is one company and I'm going to show you another two companies that uh, came from our laboratory. The technology came and uh, become companies. <laughs> the first one, is uh, I will show you about a very small robot. So in the past, we used to do open surgery. Today, we are going to more minimally invasive surgeries. And in the future, we are going to go for a micro-invasive assisted surgery with this very small robots that can actually go inside the human body and try to fix it from, from the inside. So this is one of the device uh, we developed. It's called Virop. You can see how it looks like right now, it's about one millimeter in diameter. This is how it looks like on somebody's hand on relative to an eye. And you can see it on the right hand side up how it moves under a microscope. So it's some kind of, it looks like a little bit as a bug over here, you can see it over here, but it can move through human lumens and uh, try to bring uh, medications and try to open clocks inside the human lumen. So once people start to talk about, about uh, small things that goes in the human body, uh, most of you probably, the older fellow bet between you, you will remember the Fantastic Voyage uh, Hollywood movie, where there is uh, several people that become very small, go inside the body and try to fix it from the from inside. But however, the imagination of people are uh, just light when you are talking when we are talking about small robots that goes inside the body, and this is why uh, CNN did a short movie about uh, about other development. You can see it. All. What I'm about to show you is very early, very much still in development, but it is fascinating and offers a glimpse of the future when it comes to medical technology. I'm absolutely fascinated by this. It's called the Virob. Take a look at this. This is what we're talking about here. It is a little robot, about a millimeter in uh, diameter, 14 millimeters in length, and it can move into some of the smallest areas of the body. Uh, that, that's the Virob here. Uh, that's what it looks like on somebody's finger. Take a look at how it might move through a blood vessel over here. That's the little robot over there making its way through an animation of a blood vessel. Uh, again, this isn't something that's been done in human beings yet, but just imagine something like that coursing through your body, being able to take care of problems in your blood vessels, in your digestive tract, even in your lungs. The sort of things that it might be used for one day, well, take a look at this animation over here. This is the Virob. That's a chemo agent sort of being attached to the end of the robot, and then you take that robot and you put it into somebody's trachea, like this. Again, this tiny little robot making its way down <clears throat> into all the various airways, eventually finding a specific tumor. All of this done by remote control outside the body and take that thing and put it directly into the tumor and release all that chemotherapeutic agent. It is targeted therapy like we have never seen targeted therapy before. Again, uh, very much in development, very much still off, uh, off into the possible future here. And this is something that could take years still to develop, five to 10 years. It's gonna be expensive, uh, tens of thousands of dollars probably. But think about the possibilities here, clearing a, an infection in a shunt, for example, inserting a stent, delivering chemotherapy like this. They have a few kinks to work out. One of the things, they gotta figure out how to make this thing go backwards. Once they get it in forwards, how do you turn around and bring it out? Uh, these are some of the challenges they're still gonna have, but a glimpse of the future there when it comes to the world of medical technology. Back to you. Okay, so this, is, this technology was developed in our laboratory at the Technion and it was licensed by uh, the company Microbot Medical that I just mentioned before. 
and this uh, is right now uh, got the FDA approval to go for uh, human trials. You know, this is uh, just happened uh, not far ago. And uh, what I would like to show you is the first application that we are going to use it is to, uh, to prevent shunt occlusion in hydrocephalus cases. In hydrocephalus, there's a problem of uh, too excessive fluid in the brain and uh, just people cannot live with that. It usually happens in, in children. And then there is a shunt that goes from the brain to the abdomen, which release the excessive fluid. However, this shunt is usually, not usually, but it happens that it is clogged and it can hold clogged many, many times. Our idea is to try to take the viral that I just showed you before, insert it into the shunt that actually the viral will live there for life. And uh, it will keep the shunt open all the time. So there is no pro problem that uh, when the shunt is clogged, because this is a big concern. You know, once it happened, actually you have to, to take the children to not give him a Tylenol for headache, but you have to, to run to the hospital and uh, do a CT scan. And this is a, a big concern for the, for the parents. So our first application with the viral is to prevent shunt occlusion in, hy in hydrocephalus cases. Now I would like to talk about the third company, which is Tama Robotic, which is right now is uh, being, uh, being uh, uh, supported by our crowd and we are in the investment round and uh, here it is. So the, I should say in a very not, uh, uh, not scientific words, what we are trying to do with Tamar Robotics. In Tamar Robotics, we would like to take a big tumor in the brain through a very small hole and try to take the tumor completely out. This is uh, the, the aim in very, very basic words. And here it's how it's going to do it. So the company is founded uh, by myself. It followed, followed the five years of research of uh, of Dr. Hadas Iso in my laboratory before we founded the company. And to date, uh, we raised uh, $3 million you know, before this round, which is right now, our crowd is also involved with. So uh, in brain tumor, the problem is that there is, there is a, a pressure built in, inside the brain and you have to take the tumor out in any case. And in most cases, you have to take it completely out. It is really completely, but you have to be very careful not to take too much from the brain because in this case, you know, it didn't uh, help much. So this is uh, what we would like to do today. For these cases, uh, the surgeon opened a large craniotomy opening in the brain and tried to reach the tumor. But in, in many cases, just reaching the tumor caused damage, you know, and this is really a problem. And on top of that, it is really difficult to the surgeon to take out the complete uh, tumor. And you have to do it to, to uh, avoid the uh, re, 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 um, re-surgery, to, to take the tumor completely out. So our vision is to offer high accuracy, minimally invasive brain tumor removal. And we are going to do it as follows. You can see here, this is a device. This is a robot. It has four degrees of freedom. and It works like you see here, this small movie. So you can control the motion of the tip to a different shape, cover totally 3D shape. And each one of the motion is controlled by a computer. But one thing that's really important here it is working in what it uh, in a mode that called follow the leader. So you actually you minimize the damage to a brain. This is how it works. And again, you can see here uh, the case. Uh, uh, the robot is working uh, layer by, la by layer, taking different shapes out of the brain. What you can see here on the left hand side, it is. Uh, uh, the, it, sh it shows you the problem that you cannot just rely on what it's called preoperative image. So once you take an image preoperatively, you cannot just rely on that because there is what it's called brain shift. 
So once you start to touch the brain, the brain is moving and you have to update your uh, plan every time it is as on the go. So as you continue to move. So for, for, for example, you can see here how it works. You can see here the surgeon mark the area of the tumor that he would like to remove. However, if you pay attention to the artery below, you can see that the artery is moving up. This is a black ellipse shape. And if you don't update your plan as you go, it would, you would cut through the artery, which is a big, uh, of course, it's a big damage. You don't want to do that. Here you can see in a real case, this is for example, an area that the surgeon mark, this is done in animal, the surgeon mark. And again, you can see uh, where, how the, the system is working. See it in a second. Okay. So on the, when you can see right now the yellow dot, this is the center of the needle of the robot. The surgeon marks what he would like to take out. In this case, it is uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And what you can see that this, the needle is start to moving, the robot is start to moving, cleaning this hemorrhage. It goes, it's changed from some kind of a uh, white to a little bit more black, which means the, the tumor in this case is removing. This is actual case inside the pig brain. And you can see how the motion of the robot, motion of the robot and how actually it takes out uh, this uh, hemorrhage in this case. What you can see over, This is how it works. And you can see, I'm trying to go to the next slide in a second. Okay, just move. So we will let it go all the way out. It is really important, as you can see over here, to, to try to update your plan as you go. You will see in a second, this is going to be in the, in the second, the next slide. One second. Okay, you can see it here. So left side down, you see how it looks like the brain, how it looks like before we remove the hemorrhage. And the left side up, you can see how it, it looks like after the hemorrhage was removed. And again, this is an endoscope view you can see uh, how this hemorrhage was completely moved out of the brain. Again, this is a, is a real, a very nice view that tells us the robots were actually able to take the entire hemorrhage out of the brain. Just a little bit about the, uh, about the uh, market. So you can see here, what is the procedures that we are looking at. It is in, intracranial hemorrhage, benign tumors, malignant tumors, and secondary brain tumors, which the numbers are, you can see it down here. Just what is the market size? You, again, you can see it over here. So the market is high above a billion dollars, even more than $2 billion around the world. And uh, this is what we are looking at. Just a little bit a glimpse, glimpse of medical robotics companies that there are in the market. But just, I would like to mention again that there are not too many medical robotics market, uh, ro medical robotics company out there, out there right now. It's about a dozen and maybe even less than that. But if we just look at the history of them, so you, we can see the Mazor Robotic was acquired by Medtronic for 1.64 billion. Auris acquired by GNC for about 3.4 billion. And I say, Intuitive surgical, it is the giant in this field. You see, you can see the market cap. And macro surgical is again about 0.6 billion. This is just give you an idea uh, about the market share and about the market cap of a company, of a medical robotic company. 
So this is that, and we would like to uh, you to come with us to this journey. And uh, if you would like to join us to transform neurosurgery and improve patient care for millions of patients, so, so please uh, join us in Tamar Robotics. Thank you very much for this. Thank you so much, Professor Shohan. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. It's really amazing to see the technology coming out of the Technion and, and you know, a lot of times when we're looking at, you know, companies to invest in it's, you know, it's cool technology, but this will, you know, obviously be uh, really helping people's lives in, uh, in so many ways. So it's, uh, it's very, very exciting to see that. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit now uh, about, uh, about our crowd. Thank you very much. Um, okay, good. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Technology is transforming the world um, in so many different ways. And, and what we've really seen, um, certainly over this last you know, 12, 14 months uh, of the pandemic, is that there's been a real uh, acceleration of technology. Um, the CEO of Microsoft uh, you know, remarked at uh, one point last year that you know, we've seen years of technology advancement happening in a matter of weeks or months. Um, and technology is really impacting so many different areas, you know, fintech and consumer. And of course, uh, on the health tech side, you know, um, as, uh, as Professor Shom has very clearly demonstrated on the robotic surgery side of things. So, um, the, the question for investors and, and our crowd is an investment platform is, you know, how do you access uh, investment opportunities in those types of companies? And what we've seen over the last uh, several decades is a real shift in the public markets. Um, the number of technology IPOs has dropped very, very significantly from a peak in the, in the late 90s, early 2000. Um, although we have seen a resurgence as far as the dollars raised, uh, what that means, of course, is that the companies that are going public are much, much larger and raising far uh, larger sums of uh, financing. Um, and this reflects the opportunities that investors have to make returns on those investments. If you go back to the uh, you know, early 80s and into the 90s and even early 2000s, if you had invested in any one of those leading technology companies at the IPO, um, you would be up several thousand times, not percent, but several thousand times on your investment. If you invested in Amazon's uh, IPO in 1997, you'd be up 3,500 times um, on, your, uh, on your investment, which would be, uh, of course, a, you know, a fantastic uh, outcome. Uh, what we've seen you know, really since the advent of the Facebook IPO is that the uh, market caps of companies as they go public now are much, much larger. Companies are going public much, much later in their life cycle. And what that means as an investor is that your opportunity to generate significant returns once they've gone public is much more limited than it would have been if you had invested in them as a private company. When Uber went public in 2019, it had a $75 billion market cap. If you invested $10,000 in Uber's IPO and held the stock to today, that would be worth about $14,000, which, you know, obviously is not bad. Um, if you'd invested $10,000 in Uber seed round, then that would be worth about $200 million today. What we're seeing is that the opportunity uh, is really moved to the private side um, of the market. Uh, what we're seeing even further is that for companies that are on the venture capital side of things, um, most companies never even make it to public markets. This chart shows the shift from companies that have been invested in by venture capital companies um, and how those companies exited to generate a return for those VC investors. What you've seen is you know, a shift from almost 90% of exits being IPOs to less than, significantly less than 10%. What that means is the opportunity to invest in those companies never even make to public markets, right? As Professor Shoham showed, you know, most of the companies in the surgical robotics space that have exited, with the exception of uh, uh, the Da Vinci uh, company, uh, Intuitive Robotics, um, were acquired before they ever got to the public markets. So your opportunity as an investor, if you are only going to wait for those companies to become public, never really materializes because you'll never have the opportunity to invest in those companies um, as a private company. Uh, this is being recognized by some of the largest investors in the world. Um, pension funds and endowment funds have uh, significantly shifted their allocation to alternative assets from low single digits to uh, very high uh, allocations. The Yale Endowment Fund, which is considered the premier endowment fund in the world, over $30 billion in assets, has gone from under 14% allocation in 2014 to a target this year of almost 24% of investment just in venture capital. 
Um, and what that means is they've shifted significantly away from real estate, natural resource investment, et cetera, because they recognize that that's where the long-term large opportunity for our returns lie. So companies are staying private longer. When they do exit, it's through M&A. So most of those companies will never make it to public markets. If they do actually end up as public companies, it tends to be at a very significant market cap with little room for upside from there. We've seen the smartest, largest investors in the world significantly ex ex increasing their exposure to venture capital assets specifically. And the value creation is really on the private side of the market. So the question is, as an individual investor, how do you participate in investments in these types of companies? And that is essentially what our crowd brings to the table is the ability to access in venture capital deals. So as an individual investor, historically, you had two options, two ways you could access uh, investing in venture capital type companies. Um, you could be a limited partner, an LP in a venture capital fund, um, which gives you access to great deals and professional due diligence. And you have you know, legal protections and things like that. You tend not to have any control or flexibility over the types of investments that you make. And it requires a very significant capital commitment. Your other option is as an angel investor, which gives you lots of flexibility. You can pick and choose which companies you want to invest in. The capital commitments could be very, very low. But the question is, what level of access are you getting to deals you know, outside of your local geography or outside of your local network? Who's doing the due diligence on those companies? Who's taking care of investor rights? Um, who's helping you diversify, et cetera? So what our crowd has built is a model that allows the best of both worlds. We are doing the due diligence on the companies. We have access to global deal flow. We are structuring the deals. We're taking care of investor rights. We're giving investors control and flexibility by the ability to invest over individ into individual companies, starting at very, very low investment minimums of $10,000 US into an individual company. I will uh, emphasize that you have to be an accredited investor to participate in an investment on the AirCrowd platform. We... Uh, just a little bit more about our crowd ourselves. Um, based out of Israel, um, uh, there's a press news uh, release today. Um, we were once again named as the most active venture investor in Israel uh, by PitchBook uh, again. And as of course, you know, the, the technology ecosystem in Israel is very significant, but we've really gone very global with, uh, with the company in a number of different ways. Um, we've raised uh, almost $2 billion US at this point of capital commitments and funding frameworks. We've invested in more than 250 companies um, and have had 40 exits, uh, 46 exits, excuse me, um, out of the portfolio. Um, we really leverage the network effect of the technology ecosystem around our crowd. And we look to individual investors as well to help us for the benefit of our portfolio companies. Uh, when we're investing, you know, we're doing the due diligence of the companies. We are seeing more than 200 companies every month in our deal flow. We are investing our own capital in every company and every fund that you see on the platform. So it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, people being able to put a company up on a platform and anybody can invest in it. We're doing the due diligence on those companies. We're investing our own capital. Uh, we work very closely with the companies after we've invested in them in order to help the companies be as successful as possible. And our, our success as a firm is really based on the success of you, the investor, being able to invest in those companies. And we only take the uh, a carry once investors gen uh, receive their initial investment back, including whatever fees are, are paid. Uh, we have a very, very strong, very experienced management team led by our founder, John Medved. Um, John is uh, best described, I think, as a force of nature. Um, he has uh, been a, a leading entrepreneur, taking companies public, uh, venture investor, angel investor, and started our crowd. Um, th this is just a, you know, a small selection of the executive management team, um, literally decades upon decades of investing, building, growing, and successfully exiting, which is really important, uh, venture capital companies uh, across the world globally. So just uh, to touch on the current investment opportunity, um, which as uh, Professor Shoham uh, uh, outlined is in uh, Tomorrow Robotics, I would emphasize again that uh, you must be an accredited investor to participate uh, in this investment. Um, there's uh, much more information, of course, available on our website. If you are not yet registered with our crowd, uh, you can go to ourcrowd.com um, and register, and there's lots of due diligence materials available. But just as a highlight, um, it's a $10 million Series A round. We are taking about $2 million of that. Um, just some highlights on the company from an investment perspective. Of course, with Professor Shoham as a founder, um, you know, world-leading expert in medical robotics, um, 
the technology itself is a significant advantage over existing technology, um, which the company has already demonstrated in the lab and in animals. Um, the market itself is growing as people are using more and more surgical ro robots um, to take care of surgery. Um, and as uh, Professor Shom also alluded to, the uh, benchmarks for exits um, has been very significant uh, with some very, very high profile, um, very successful exits from companies uh, that have been acquired in the uh, medical robot space. Again, acquired and not having gone public. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Daron, um, who will uh, wrap it up for us and we will open it up for, uh, for Q&A. There is a Q&A button uh, you should see at the bottom of your screen there. Um, you can put in your questions there and I'll be moderating the, uh, the Q&A session. Well, I don't have much more to say except to uh, thank Professor Sean for uh, first of all doing good for all those years and uh, both for the patients and for uh, investors and engineers involved in his uh, ventures. And uh, to thank uh, our crowd for bringing him over and uh, telling us about those wonderful new inventions and uh, opportunities. Thank you so much, Doron. And of course, thank you again to our friends at, uh, at Technion uh, Canada. So I'm going to start uh, going through the questions here. Um, and you know, I'll be able to answer some and Professor Shoham uh, the others. Uh, Professor Shoham, the first question is, how do you access the brain safely with the robot? <laughs> thank you for the questions. But uh, what we do, we are going through a, a small, relatively small, what is called bear hole relative to what uh, today is done, craniotomy, which is a big opening. So we are going much smaller inside the brain. Now, we do preoperative imaging and we mark the center, let's say, of the tumor that we would like to reach. We can go directly to this point, the same way as you do biopsy in the brain. Now, once you're inside, the robot is start working, the brain is moving and we have sensors that looks just ahead of you to see whether the tissue in just in front, of, in front of you is a healthy tissue or a cancerous tissue. And we are able to, to uh, treat it and to take it out. So this is how we go inside. And again, I said the going inside with the robot is much less morbidity than what you have right now with the open craniotomy. Thank you, Professor Shoham. The next question is also uh, for you. Uh, the question is, how do you manage bleeding in the brain if it, if it occurs? It's a good question, and we will tackle this problem. Uh, I didn't show you, but we we have a, a way, we have a laser inside, inside the robot itself. So once there is a bleeding and we can see that, we can uh, coagulate the bleeding. And uh, I didn't show you that, but uh, we have done several, uh, several uh, experiments with that we, because we think this really can be a, a big problem. And uh, this is why we treated and we found that we have to insert a laser fiber inside in order to coagulate uh, the blood vessel in case we actually bleeding occur. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you. Next question is also for you, Professor Shoham. Uh, there's work being done apparently in Toronto using focused ultrasound to remove tumors non-invasively. Can you comment on that as a potential competitive technology? Yeah, th this is again, this is the company is in, in Saitech actually, which is also in Haifa, not far from the Technion. Uh, and and an our crowd investment also. Also, okay. Uh, this is a really great idea with InsightTech, but uh, one of the problem with that is uh, with the InsightTech, with, with the focused ultrasound, you can treat something uh, very small locations, like for example, essential tremor. This is something that can be treated, but you cannot decompress the brain, which means if you have, if you have a tumor and you have compression, you have high pressure in the brain, in this case, the, the focus ultrasound will not decompress, decompress the pressure in the brain. So you have to take it out in any case. So this is a different, but exact, but I said that insight tech is really a great idea. Great, thank you. We'll give you a break for a second. The next question is for me. And the question is, uh, what is an accredited investor? So uh, the accreditation rules differ country to country. Uh, if you are based here in Canada, um, you would have to meet any one of the following criteria, not all of them, but any one of. So to be an, a, considered an accredited investor in Canada, you would have to have any one of $200,000 of personal income, $300,000 of household income, 
a uh, million dollars of net assets, net financial assets, not including your primary residence. So just owning a home here in Toronto doesn't uh, doesn't qualify you um, or five million dollars of net assets. Uh, if you're uh, on the webinar from somewhere else, the jurisdiction uh, accreditation rules change jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, if you message me afterwards, we can uh, we can find out for you specifically. The next question is uh, back to Professor Shoham. Um, do you see any robotic uses in operations such as gallbladder, which are currently done laparoscopically or, and I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this properly, inguinal hernias? I see. Okay. Uh, fine. Thank you. So this, both these uh, procedures are done very, very well and uh, with a high success rate uh, using laparoscopic today, which is, I think it is fine. Uh, I, I'm not sure that actually you can do ro robotically or you would like to do robotically because as it is right now, it is a very good outcome. But in any case, uh, the robot uh, Da Vinci by Intuitive Surgical, you can do it uh, by remote manipulation. I just want to say one word about this. Da Vinci is working remote manipulation, which means the surgeon moves his hand and the robot moves accordingly maybe scale down motion, may scale, may scale down the forces. What we do is, is different. What we do right now with Mazor and with all other uh, companies that we I just show you is give the robot more, I should say, more freedom, which means the surgeon does the decision, but uh, the robot performs it not relating actually about uh, over the uh, surgeon hand motion. And I think we would like to take these points of the of the robot that it excels, which means high accuracy, high accessibility, and just leave it to the robot to do that. So this is what we do. Of course, uh, the surgeon is always on control. But in terms of your questions regarding the gallbladder and the hernia, it is uh, I think it's done very well today, even with uh, laparoscopic and also with intuitive surgical can do this. Well, Great, thank you. Uh, next question, is uh, R&D for Tamar uh, being done only in Israel or do you have international collaborators? Oh, the R&D is done in Israel, but we have collaborators, uh, surgeons from all over the world. I think we talked to maybe like uh, 25 of them on the board. We have, I think uh, like three or four that are not in, from Israel. And I think, uh, David, you, you have it uh, on your deck that you can show uh, which who, who of the doctors right now are on uh, our advisory board? So we have we have uh, people from outside of Israel, but the R&D is done in Israel. Great, thank you. We'll see if we can uh, we can pull that up. Uh, the next question is: How are you maneuvering the robot in three dimensions? Okay, we are talking about Tamar Robotic, I assume. Not I would the assume robot, yes. About Tamar Robotic. What happened over there, maybe I was not that clear. The robot itself has what we call a four degrees of freedom, which means we can control and we can bring the tip of the robot to a precise location in three dimensional because everything is computer controlled. And uh, we can uh, actually, the, the surgeon mark a point on the screen and the robot goes there. Uh, there is a combination of uh, rotation and translation that we know how to calculate in order to bring the robot to the specific location where the surgeon mark on the screen. So if you would like to go more into details, I will be happy to do that, but I'm not sure that all the audience uh, will, uh, would like me to do that. Okay, perhaps, perhaps we can take that offline. Uh, next question is, are there any veterinary clinical trials planned or in progress? For, I yeah. assume for Tamar. Right, I, uh, right now we are doing uh, uh, our, we did our, uh, experiments on, we, do, we did it on uh, small animals like rats. This is one we did. And right now we are working on pigs. And this is usually, this is what we are doing today. We have run, I think, um, maybe like 20 experiments already in, inside the brain. But we will go to do, uh, we will go, we keep on going with uh, what we call big animal. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you able to reach deep lesions as well? Yes, this is this is correct. We can we can reach deep lesions. There is actually there is no uh, there is no problem in terms of mechanics to reach uh, deep lesions. We can do that. 
we can calculate also the trajectory so it doesn't go through eloquent regions. So we, can, we don't have to go in a straight line. We can go not in a straight line and try to circumvent this eloquent, eloquent regions that we don't want to be there. So in terms of mechanically to reach depletion, this is something that we can do. Okay. Um, and just confirming, the removal of tissue is based on suction? What we do right now, we use a water jet and suction. So there is a very small water jet. I don't know, I didn't show it to you, but there is a, there is a, a water jet that cut the tissue and then we suck it out. Okay, great. Um, what would you see as the next big milestones uh, for the company and the timelines for those milestones? The, the, our big milestone next, uh, you know, we're looking right now for what it's called first in human. So this is what we would like to achieve. Um, in terms of timeline, I can j just tell you, you know, approximately, I don't want to say, to tell you it exactly, but I believe we are going to be in first in human in something like about a year and a half. Okay. Um, how are you visualizing the tumor resection in 3D real time um, if the ultrasound technology is 2D? Okay, this is a, this is a good question. And uh, what we do, um, I didn't show you how the ultrasound is connected right out to the, to the needle, but as the needle moves, and as the needle rotates, so, so this uh, the ultrasound probe is attached to this one. So it's attached to the robot. So once you scan with the 2D, you actually get the 3D. So if you are just looking ultrasound, it gives you the plane, one plane, but we scan with the plane and this is how we generate the three dimensional view of what we're actually seeing. And there is also possibility if you would like just to do this scanning. So dimensional, you can just uh, move the robot so that it doesn't interfere and you can just make a scan and you actually get three-dimensional scan of uh, what you're going to, to tackle. Okay, great. I'll, I'll give you a break for a second. The next couple of questions are for me. Um, the question is about uh, returns for our crowds over the last five years. Um, the question is net of fees. So uh, I don't have the net of fees number off the top of my head, but I can tell you um, that if you look at our exits over the last five years, we're generating about a 29% uh, gross IRR. So that's compound annual return. Uh, it's about a two times multiple uh, on the exits that we've had over the last uh, five years. We can provide more detailed information under NDA. So again, you can contact me, uh, david.shore at ourcrowd.com um, if you're interested, and I can give you additional details on that. Um, the next question is, will this investment be included in the latest OC50 fund? Um, it is not 100% confirmed, but uh, I believe it is on the list of one of the next companies uh, that would be included in the latest OC50 fund. Um, those that are interested, we are closing uh, OC50 um, imminently, and there is potentially still opportunity to participate in that as well. Um, you can contact me uh, if you're interested. Uh, next question, back to Professor Shoham. Um, have you ever worked in neurosurgery directly? Yeah, this is yes. Uh, okay, I'm not a doc, I'm, I'm not an MD doctor, but in any case, uh, Mazo Robotics developed the robot also for brain surgery, actually for what it's called the deep brain stimulation, where you insert, you have to insert electrode to a specific precise location inside the brain. And Mazo Robotics developed this device, and right now uh, it has been used in, uh, I think, about 1,000 cases, mainly in the United States, to place the electrode for example, to treat uh, Parkinson at a precise location. Uh, and this is done with the robot with a, with a very high accuracy. But this one done with the Mazor, it is not something that the robot that can go inside the brain and make some kind of a treatment. It is in this case, it just precise, just locating precisely an electrode at a specific location in order to treat, as I mentioned just now, Parkinson. There is a difference between what Tamar Robotics can do and what uh, Mazor can do with that, but this is something that we work in neurosurgery before. Okay, great. Thank you. We, we have a few more questions and then we're, we're going to stop there. Um, so the last couple of questions. Um, can you talk about the intellectual property portfolio for Tamar? 
Yeah, I think, uh, okay, just on top of my head, I think we have, uh, we have pi five patents that we already filed, two of them already granted, and uh, there is going to be more that's going to be filed, but uh, there are in several, like some of them in a PCT level, things like that, so all of them in the process. As I mentioned, two already granted. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the question is, uh, you showed a stroke or uh, ICH, I assume that's intracranial hemorrhage, but there is no evidence to surgically operate on these. How will you handle? I'm not sure I understand the question, perhaps you do. No, I, I would like to read it again, please. Um, the question is, you showed a stroke or ICH, but there yes. is no evidence to surgically operate on these. How will you handle? Okay, I'm not I'll, try to, I'll try to answer. I, I hope this will be the right answer. But uh, what we can do, we can uh, <clears throat> we can evacuate uh, the ICH intracranial hemorrhage uh, by the robot, and we can do it in such a way that we don't damage uh, what is called the margin between the the uh, hemorrhage and between between the brain. Um, I think I showed you one picture over there that we actually evacuated intracranial hemorrhage and we did it in many, many times already in uh, animals. And uh, what we do also, which I think is really important, we also provide the surgeon with an uh, endoscopic view so that it is something close what he used to see through a microscope. And this is for regulatory uh, purposes. We, we would like to say that actually what the surgeon is saying when, when he does it, it is similar to what he can do right now with his own end through, through a microscope. So this is why we end, uh, add also endoscope into this uh, into the robot. Okay, and, and then just, I guess, uh, another question, but it would be a good follow-on from that. Is, is it an optical vision system that the, the robot has? Yes, we see we have uh, an endoscope optical vision system, and also we have an ultrasound, as I just mentioned before. Uh, we would like to add... Uh, one more device uh, in order to distinguish between uh, between cancerous cells and healthy cells uh, using some kind of fluorescentic uh, uh, agent. So this is something different, but we also, we did it already in, in rats, uh, but we, then we also, we rely on some kind of optic to tell us uh, what are the margins and how much we, we should take out so that we don't on one side, brain uh, damage the brain, and on the other side, we take the entire tumor out. Okay. Um, how many operations have been done in animals, and what types of tumors? We work uh, on a big animal, on pigs. We work up to now with uh, hemorrhage, and I think maybe we did like a 20, something like that. I think maybe the more yesterday we did one. So I think uh, at least 20. However, uh, on rats, we work with uh, uh, on uh, tumors. Also, it's about uh, several several tens. I don't recall right now. And uh, so this was in red, but in red it was very difficult because we work we worked uh, we want to work minimally invasive, but you know the entire brain of the a rat is not that big. So even for a pig, is not that big. You know, you no know, pig is a big animal, but with a small brain. So. But in any case, uh, we work uh, on, a, on a tumors in the uh, rats. This is what we did. On pigs right now, we are working with uh, hemorrhage, and I think this is going to be our first uh, application, intracranial hemorrhage. Okay. Um, what about doing brain biopsies? Okay, brain biopsy, it is something that it is, uh, I should say, you know, simpler. Uh, because you have to go straight, straight line to the right location and take part of the biopsy from a specific location. This can be done with the Mazor robot as well, because as I mentioned before, Mazor robot just tells you where to go and uh, just uh, either place an electrode or take a biopsy from one point. We don't, uh, with the robots that right now is Tamar Robotics, we can do that, but I don't think this is a purpose because it can, it can do much more than that. So we can take biopsy, but of course uh, we can to take out also tumors and we can take out also hemorrhage. So I don't see any point to use, uh, to use the Tamar robotic for this one, but it can be done. 
It can be done also with thermal robotics. Okay. Uh, would you see this being able to be used, of course, uh, for other surgical applications other than brain surgery? Yeah, this is correct. Uh, we are going right now for the brain, but uh, I think in the list over there, uh, we can do it. Uh, we can take it to other locations as well. Um, as I mentioned, it can be taken to the liver, for example. We are going also to use uh, the water jet to cut and to suck out what we would like to do. And uh, this is something that uh, can be do later, but I think first we are going to for the brain. Okay. Um, would, would you be able to use the robot to implant leads inside the brain? Uh, okay, just mentioned before, it's called the deep brain stimulation, DBS. It is where you insert electro to a specific locations. I think the robot can do that, but uh, as I mentioned before, it is relatively simpler a job for the robot to do that. The robot can do that, but I don't think that this is the main benefit or main advantage of, of thermal robotics. Okay. A uh, couple last questions here, if, if you don't mind. A uh, no, no. lot, lot, lot of interest. Um, what's the regulatory path and when do you expect revenue to start? Okay, so again, the regulatory path that we are going to go along is uh, we would like to go for a 510K. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the company Exact Robotics, this is another company that, uh, that came out from our laboratory, got FDA approval for a robot. Uh, they are doing uh, uh, steering a needle inside the liver, for example. Uh, what they, and what we think right now is that we will be able to go as a predicate device to take the Exact Robotics as our predicate device. And I think that uh, this is how we'll go for 15K or 15K de novo. This is one thing, it is uh, definitely not PMA. So this is one thing. And the other questions about revenue, I yes. think, uh, well, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict the future, but our prediction is, it is about, I believe we are going, uh, as I mentioned, first, uh, first in human is going to be about a year and a half. Uh, I don't want to speculate over here, but maybe you can do the calculations. You know, after first in human, we will go to several clinical trials and then go to the FDA. And I think this is going to be uh, our path. Okay. Um, how, how would the robot navigate around eloquent or functional areas of the brain so as not to damage them? If you have tumors that it have infiltrated, infiltrated into them, well, it's a good question. It's a very good question. What we do is as follows. We first take a proprioceptive image, <clears throat> let's say MRI, for example, and we, we can do what is called registration, which means we have the same coordinate system for the tumor and for the robot. It is called registration to put them on the same coordinate system. So first we are going inside the tumor so that we know that there is right now, there is no, um, no eloquent region because we are in tumor right now. And then we are going from the tumor outside. And as, as I mentioned before, we can go very complicated shape because we have control on all dimensions on X, Y, Z and also rotations. So we can go in a different uh, shapes. Um, if you can look at the, uh, I think one of the picture was that showed how we took a, uh, how we took out uh, um, hemorrhage. So it, it, it was not like a sphere. It was, you know, it went a lot, some kind of odd shapes and we were able to do that because we can we have control on the entire 3D, 3D uh, axis and we can actually reach these places. But we are going one thing, we are going from the tumor outside. Okay. Is, uh, is the robot collecting tissue for histology while you're removing the tumor? Sure, we, we take it, we have suction, we can take the suction out and we, we can just keep it for histology if we would like to do that. This is definitely true. Okay, you, you may have answered this and I, I'm not sure I 100% understand the question. I, I am okay. certainly far from a medical expert. Um, is How do you reach the lesion? Is there a self-alignment system respective to the preoperative trajectory? And if yes, is there a system to register the patient? I think that's what you were just talking about, but I just wanted to be clear. Okay. Okay, I just uh, would like to say it in a little bit in the scientific words. We have to put on the same coordinate system three things. The preoperative image, the head, 
and the robot. All three of them have, we have to put on the same coordinate system. This is called the registration. This is what we call the registration. Once we do that, we can mark on the screen of the imaging a point and the robot, we can just direct the robot to go to the same, to the precise location. So how we do that, uh, this is something that we did in the past. Um, there is a, we can, I can go inside the details over here, but uh, I just want to say that this is something that we did in the past and we are able to do the registration. Okay, last two questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you for, uh, for giving us the time. Sure. Um, how much of your time personally is, uh, is spent on Tamar Robotics? Uh, okay, actually I talk with uh, Noam. Noam is the CEO of the company, so I talk with him every day and I visit the company uh, once a week. But we talk every day, you know, morning, evening. I just want to say, you know, very small anecdote if there is a time for that. Sure. Noam, Noam Hasidov is the CEO of the company. He built my uh, medical robotic laboratory at the Technion, the MRL, medical robotic laboratory. He was an architect. And uh, he built this, uh, he did an excellent job for this. So once he does that, he, want, he, say, he came to me and he said, I would like to work in your, in your field. And I told him, come on, you're an architect, excellent architect. Why should you do all these courses and go to this? Uh, but he, he insisted. And actually he took all the courses in mechanical engineering and, and he did with me the masters. And then uh, he went and uh, he was the CEO of the company. And I think he was over the uh, Motors company right now. It's traded to NASDAQ and he raised it about $15 million over there. So he is very determined person and I really uh, rely on him very much. And right now he's running this company, Tamar Robotics. Okay. Oh, that's great. Last question. Um, do you expect to raise additional funds before you do First New Human or is this funding round going to get you there? No, I think this will get us to the first in human. This is. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Shoham. Thank you. Um, it was really a pleasure hearing from you. Yeah, um, you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for the detailed uh, technical questions. Um, uh, I'd like to thank again uh, our friends at, uh, at Technion Canada. Uh, we are very excited, of course, to always partner with them. This is uh, not the first event we've done with them. It won't be the last. Um, you know, we are, we are very involved, of course, in many companies that come out of the Technion. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, um, you can certainly send them to me, uh, david.shore at ourcrowd.com. Um, really appreciate everybody uh, joining us today for what was a, a fascinating uh, discussion on uh, the future of medical robotics. Um, and uh, we really thank uh, Professor Shoham for his time today.